I'm with Ian Rawls. Ian, tell me a bit about how you got into sound and why it sort of fascinates you so much. What, what started you off? I got a job at the British Library Sound Archive as a storeman, or as it was called there, a vault keeper. And that was quite an old term which went back to its founding in the 1950s when it was the British Institute of Recorded Sound. And the vault keeper's job was to put things away and take them out again. So all day long I was handling crates of old records, old tapes, CDs, pretty much every kind of sound carrier that you can imagine. And I guess through a natural process I became curious about what I was carrying around up and down ladders or loading onto pallet lifts and so on. And it did seem to me that a lot of the recordings in their collection were not always made by professionals, but by enthusiastic amateurs, be they ornithologists or people with uh, other interests in wildlife sound. There were even some more eccentric collections. There was a man who had gone around and recorded the sound of every foghorn in Britain, and that's become quite a well-known collection. And a more obscure one was a chap in Yorkshire who, with a tape recorder, took every journey that you can by bus in Yorkshire and recorded the sounds of it. And then in a meticulous, tiny handwriting, he wrote the details of the journey on the back of each tape box. So I thought, well, if you can record sounds of buses in Yorkshire, there must be something interesting to record in London. But that also met a need as well. I'd wanted to do a website about London for some years, but I couldn't think of an original angle or a focus for it. And after a bit, an interest in sound recording and an interest in London came together. It took, I'm a little bit embarrassed about how long it took those two ideas to mesh, but they did come together. And in 2009, my website, the London Sound Survey, went online. And how did you start? What did you use to, to begin with? How did you sort of decide to sort of the kit and all that? What did you put together to, to, to start on? I wanted something which would sound as if you were there. And from the research I did online and by asking people at work, they mentioned this concept called binaural recording, which consisted of putting two tiny mics in each of your ears. And when you make a binaural recording and then play it back, listen to it through headphones, it sounds very realistic and lifelike. You might even fancy that you're in that location if you shut your eyes. I didn't pick that exact arrangement. Instead, I bought a pair of mics from an engineer in America called Lenny Lombardo, who made what he calls his Sonic Studios line of mics. Now, Sonic Studios is a little cottage industry, and it really involves a rather homemade looking setup in which two mics are mounted on each side of your head, roughly where your temples are, and you go around and record like that. It, doesn't, it looks a bit odd, but it's not too obtrusive. Now you ask what was the first thing I recorded. Well, the very first thing that I recorded was a trip to the corner shop to buy tobacco and a can of cider. And then the second thing I recorded, which is on my website, was a morning at Petticoat Lane Market. In East London and that captured all the, the cries of the market traders and the other street sounds going on. When I got back home and listened to it, listened to what was on the recorder, that was a very rewarding experience. It felt quite unusual to have the sounds of the outdoors abruptly brought inside so it was almost as if you'd kind of opened a little portal and the sounds of the outside world were mysteriously and in a slightly alarming way brought into your living room. And that became a self-reinforcing habit. I wanted to go out and record more and more and bring more of these sounds home. That's amazing. Now, can you tell us how many sounds you've got on your site? And tell us about your site and the URL for it and all that as well. Well, the site's called the London Sound Survey. The URL is soundsurvey, that's all one word, .org.uk. There are about 1,700 different recordings on the site. I don't know how much that totals in time, perhaps, I think, maybe 40 hours. Um, and there are all different kinds of subjects in London. Events, people's voices, the sounds of places, 
sounds of wildlife, sounds of captive animals in zoos, and there are also a small section of sounds which I've collected from the past. I mean to say recordings that I haven't made myself, but ones which have been made by recorders in the past, in fact as far back as 1928. And all those together comprise the sound part of the London Sound Survey. There are other things on the site as well. Most of the sounds are organised according to various visual schemes called sound maps or sound graphics and they're the kind of interface that site visitors see and which I hope encourage people to explore the collections of recordings. And what, what tell us a bit more about those interfaces because they seem, it seems quite popular now. I mean, I think you're one of the, the early people doing that but it's, 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 it's the, the idea of laying on um, sounds on a map yeah. and then sort of being able to sort of click on or listen to or explore. Well, that's a London invention, actually. The, the very first person to build a sound map was an artist in South London called Steve Tanzer. And he made a series of sound maps uh, featuring different cities around the world. And he uploaded some rather brief recordings, some, some of them only 10 or 15 seconds long. But he had established the basic principle was that you looked at a map, nowadays that's usually provided by Google Maps, and there is a small icon in a particular spot on the map, um, a place marker, and if you click on the icon, an audio player pops up and opens on the screen, and you get to hear the recording. And also you may get to read something about the recording as well, what archivists call metadata, which is information about the recording, how long it is, when it was recorded, what features in it and so on. So Steve Townsend was the first person to do that and that was I think from about 2002 or 2001 and then other people began to join in. There was a sound map from New York which I think was set up in about 2006 or 2005. Now I hadn't seen a sound map uh, but somebody once just somebody once used the phrase sound map in a conversation and within about a minute I had a mental image of what a sound map would look like and how it would work. I didn't use Google Maps because I couldn't understand what's called the application protocol interface or the API, which is really the programming you need to do to make it work. I couldn't understand that. So I did a simpler form which split London up into a series of grids. I think I was inspired by a bingo card or a lottery ticket. The idea of numbers within a grid framework and the numbers would correspond to how many recordings were in a particular neighbourhood and I really went from there. And you're still doing it week on week? Yes, I think it's unlike the usual approach where people have a geographically accurate map with place markers corresponding to pretty precise spots. I've moved away from that. I prefer to have more abstract or impressionistic graphics I don't think that the human mind really works exactly like a map when we build up our representations of places. I think they're more like a series of propositions, like turn left at the dog and duck, or it's a bit of an uphill climb this route, or that's not a very great area to go, or you know, there's always a puddle in this alleyway. I think our sense of place is mainly built up, built up out of propositions or statements. And so I take a more graphical rather than map-like approach. And I hope that has some element or, or some feel for propositions in it. It's not really meant to be geographically accurate. It's a little bit like the way the tube map isn't geographically accurate. It embodies a series of propositions, like you have to change at bank or it's a long way to Cockfosters or something like that. So I take that diagrammatic or schematic approach more and I think it gives you more freedom for experimentation with graphics. So what, what are your plans for the, for the site in the future? Well, um, I guess at some point it will stop being just about London and other places will creep into it. But I don't have any definite plans for that yet. I think that London still demands my attention for at least another couple of years. But then it would be nice to look elsewhere. I'm also curious about changing or experimenting with new directions. Now when many people think of changing direction in recording, I guess one of the first questions which springs to mind is 
what equipment you use, or perhaps I should use a contact microphone, which is a special mic that you can stick onto surfaces and it will pick up the vibrations moving for them. Or a hydrophone, which is a mic which you can you know, drop into a pond or a river and you can record the sounds going on under there. That can make an important difference, but I don't think it's the most fundamental difference. The basic issue in recording is the relationship between the recorders and their subject. So if you want to make a fundamental change, you want to change that relationship. What I do, I call attentive recording. What it means is, is that there isn't any interaction between me and my subject. Something is happening somewhere and I go along and record it. And whether I'm there or not makes no difference to that sound. It will carry on regardless. In contrast, what we're doing now, for example, is collaborative recording. There is a relationship mm -hmm. between us. Information is flowing both ways. So that's a different type of relationship. Other ones, well, there's what we might call self-reflexive recording. That's where you keep an audio diary. Or you're like the chap in Crap's Last Tape, the Samuel Beckett play. Or you're a podcaster recording your message in a bottle to throw out onto the internet and hope somebody picks it up and listens to it. And then there is a transformative approach, which is used by sound artists or foley artists. They record something not with a mind to reproducing it accurately, but as grist for some kind of further creative process to transform the sound, perhaps in ways which make it completely unlike the original sound source. Amazing. <laughs> Just I'm stumped there because you just you don't you know so much about it, which is and you're so no. fluent about 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 the sort of processes and uses of them. I mean, what's come to my mind recently was the um, the British Library um, starting to sort of uh, push these out as events mm. and archive uh, around themes right. in terms of people. Um, I think one of the ones that, is it Cheryl Tip who did yes. the Lost Sounds, which was. Um, or sounds that were, were lost, um, or had a theme of, of loss, uh, with, a, with a group of artists at the British Library oh, okay. recently. Yeah. Now she might have, perhaps that was referring to the sounds, for example, of extinct animals. That's right, yes. Or uh, languages which are now extinct, or kinds of machinery which are no longer in use. Now that's quite a common theme in recording and archiving. Sometimes it's wheeled out to suggest a degree of urgency sometimes even to help with getting grant funding. But it's quite a common trope in recording to say that you're out there capturing sounds which will soon disappear, and this adds a certain importance to your recording work. I think that in some instances that's very justified. There are things which should be recorded before they're gone, and they're likely to be gone soon. But I think in the case of the things that I record, well, I don't think there's really any urgency there. Or if they are going to be gone soon, they may not be missed. I mean, there are things like bottle banks, and I've recorded <laughs> bottle banks being emptied. It's a pretty striking sound. Maybe one day bottle banks will be superseded by something else, and you won't hear that clattering, uh, chinking sound that you get. But who will miss it? I don't know. <laughs> but you see, the context of it, as time moves on, it changes that context. I mean, very much like when you gave that talk, um, down in Archway mm. the other Sunday, where you actually took sound back yeah. through the ages. And mm. that was fascinating to listen to because you were you were contextualizing all the sort of reasons or or purposes of people recording those sounds mm. and the archiving. And and, and I, I found it almost irritating the fact that you said it was your hobby because it doesn't seem to be me to be it seems much more than a hobby to me. It seems to be something that you've d devoted a hell of a lot of time to, and you've yeah. got this big body of work, and that for mm. me is, is not a hobby, it's, it's a kind of work over several years in many ways. Well, it is, it is, it's a very serious hobby. It's important to me. I guess it is a form of self-actualization, if you want to sound fancy about <laughs> it. And I think for many people, their hobbies are precisely that. Now, somewhere where you go away from the strictures and demands of work, and you are in control of what you're doing, you are creating freely without any obvious uh, external requirement to do so. Um, so certainly this has done that for me. 
it has been an area of life in which I've been able to create freely. And when, whether it's the results are good or bad, mediocre or indifferent, is entirely up to me. So I get the credit for when it's good and I have to take the blame <laughs> for when it's bad. And um, it's, it's interesting because it's just like, it's like poetry. Poetry is very sort of on the edge of the arts if you want to take a corollary and um it but it exists and it's there throughout mm. the decades and it will be there throughout the decades it's, it's what i call a slow burn yeah and something like this um it, it fascinates me because it really is fascinating to those people who are fascinated mm. by sound and it will always be fascinating to people who love sound in mm. that sense so it's a slow burn it's never going to be a big, big mainstream thing no, it won't be, no. but it's there in the background mm. and it's a consistent thing that, that mm -hmm. brings a lot of joy to a lot of people, I think. Mm. And when I actually went to the British Library and met several people who told their stories around when they were recording, it was almost fascinating to hear the stories mm. around where they were and what and the context they'd had and, you know, all that. It was just, just, just really, really interesting um, mm. to, to have that kind of network of people and, and listening and, and watching them do that and it will never be mainstream it'll never be sort of celebrity status it will never be no. those big things in the sky but it's but it's one of those things that runs like a thread through through life mm -hmm. for lots of people and will always be there you know like background radiation or something it's just something that is there that is um joyful and wonderful i think well i hope it will be around um, I can't think why it shouldn't be, but you are right, surely, when you say that it will never come to rival photography or video. Um, I guess there are different reasons for that. We might say that we live in a visual culture, um, particularly in a commercial or consumer society. Seeing is a foretaste of possessing. Seeing is hugely important to advertising and marketing. Now I know that there are sound branding companies and a lot of effort is put into ensuring that car doors close with a certain noise and so on. But compared to the visual sense, that's, you know, it's an order of magnitude greater. Nonetheless, there is room for a kind of hole in the corner appreciation of sound, which is not to do immediately with listening to the human voice. If you think about it, to a first approximation, all recorded sound is of the human voice or of some analogue of it. Some people claim that music uh, has inherited many of the features of the voice, such as prosody, rhythm, even melody. But there are other sounds out there, as well as the ones people just make with their voices. And people like me are there to record them and present them. But, as you say, I don't expect huge numbers of people to be particularly interested in them. Sometimes though there are interesting exceptions and I think where, where the exceptions occur is where the sounds give a sense of realism. And there's a recording on YouTube called The Virtual Barbershop which is a binaural recording of it's as if you're getting your hair cut so you can hear the scissors snipping on this side of the head and then on the other side voices in the room and so on. It's had a tremendous number of views, considering it has no moving image associated with it. That's really surprising. I don't know, 20 million views or listens. So now and again, some things break out unexpectedly and reach a wide audience. Yeah, I think you're referring to those all those channels that people, they, they recorded by an oral. Um, are they called, called AS... ASMR, MR. which I think stands for... Um, uh, autonomic sensory motor response. Yes, it does nothing for me, I'm afraid, but, but well, I can see why how it does it for some people. It's a dissociative experience. If you think of the popularity in some circles of drone music, indeed of drone, not just in the present day, but for hundreds of years it's had its little niche. It's a little bit like that. Some people have dissociative feelings where they seem to drift off into another world or they become very relaxed when they hear droning sounds. I used to do that when I heard my mum hoovering the house. And that makes a kind of droning sound, and I find that oddly comforting. And I think people that are devotees of the ASMR phenomena and the incredibly long recordings which are made and uploaded to YouTube, they're getting the same kind of thing out mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. They find it comforting and relaxing. 
And some people say that they use it for studying too, or for falling asleep too. I had I had a theory about it that it was it it could be sort of akin to sort of going back to childhood and your mother talking to you and yeah. very gently because a lot of it's in whispers and yes, it is. things like that. So I, I just just that that's what that's a theory, but I, I doubt if that could be proven. It's a very interesting sound phenomenon. It's completely bottom up. It's not something which academics or or high profile sound artists have said this is the thing to get into. It's completely. Uh, as a completely popular basis. So, you've got all these wonderful sounds, you've got this website, I know I asked you this before, and you, you want to widen it. I mean, um, is there anything, a couple of things I want to ask you before we end, is what's your favorite recording? What's okay. the one you've enjoyed the most? And um, is there a sort of area that's totally different that you, you, you're thinking of going into in terms of that, those two things? Right, to answer your first question, that's a tough one because there are several recordings which were particularly enjoyable to make or were particularly surprising. Recently, um, I've done quite well with a recording made inside Tower Bridge. Now, inside Tower Bridge, inside each of the two towers, there is a big uh, brick-lined void called a bascule chamber. And it's where the road section's counterweight sinks when the bridge is lifted. Now, it sinks quite slowly into this space, and you can't be in there at the time that it does that, otherwise you'll get squashed. But you can observe it from a gantry high up. And Tower Bridge kindly let me in to make recordings of the lifting of the bridge. And I set up my mic to record on a gantry. And I didn't stay with it while the bridge lifted. I went and recorded somewhere else and left that particular mic and recorder running. When I got back, retrieved it, went home and listened to it. And this was a very surprising result. There is an, a, a complete orchestration of sounds. They're not just sounds, they are actually tones which are produced as the counterweight sinks, as this 110-year-old machinery plus a modern electric motor swings into action. It's hard to put into words, but it's a very grave solemn sound if you have listened to enough 20th century classical music you will probably feel a response in you to its sound and that was taken up by a composer called Ian Chambers and developed into a musical piece which was then performed back inside the Baskill chamber just a few weeks ago so that whole experience of making the recording listening to it sharing it and then having Ian Chambers rework it, completing the circle. That was very satisfying indeed. Now your second question was what am I going to do next? What other areas would I like to explore? To return to the original theme of relationships of recording, I would like to explore more along the lines of the collaborative approach, which is really making field recordings but also interviewing people. I think one of the things that are most memorable about visiting a place is who you meet there and who you get talking to. They are part of the experience of the place. So I'd like to experiment and try that as well. Not just recording sounds, but actually interviewing people too. Ian Royce, thank you so much. Thank you.